so I've had conversations with people in, you know, in fairly senior positions now and suggested that you know, in the history of any arms buildup, such as is being proposed now to compete, there never has been an instance in American history where they didn't come with some kind of discussion of, well, what's the prize in the box? You know, what, what are we competing for? What exactly is the end game that makes this worth the candle? And that usually presidents like Reagan and others who have done arms buildup back into this brief if they get reelected, but that you can't start too early trying to figure out, well, what might that story be? What exactly you know, is the benefit? Um, so I, I kind of feel like we're getting ahead of the news here by trying to nut out what might make sense given the interests and stated objectives of this administration. Roughly, that's what we're going to try to go through. And let's see here, we have a, there is something, I, who cares, we got this. Um, here are the questions we're going to try to get through today. Um, first, what are those views of the Trump administration regarding nuclear weapons and their control? I think for counterpoint, it's useful to say, well, you know, roughly how do they differ from the previous administration? Um, what nuclear threats has the administration identified that arms control might help reduce? And then what previous arms control efforts offer guidance on how one might help reduce those threats diplomatically? So that's what we're gonna go through. Um, I should note that I'm focusing on military nuclear threats and um, there is actually a nuclear threat posed by dual-use nuclear technology, nuclear power, and the things attendant to it. Now, I prepared to deliver that to you, but when I got to slide 60, I thought better of it. And so, luckily, a Professor Bannister has a class which will be held in AEB, that's Alpha Echo Bravo 360, uh, on Wednesday the 31st at 6 p.m. I promise to deliver what's not in this brief there, which is what are the dangers that we're facing probably, I'm gonna, I haven't quite done all the work on it, but in the Middle East and East Asia with regard to the spread of supposedly peaceful nuclear energy and what should we think about those dangers and how might we mitigate them. That is not gonna be in this brief. We're gonna be looking at the pointed end of uh, nuclear uh, threats, which is the military nuclear uh, portion that's already weaponized. All right, so with that in mind, uh, I, I won't walk you through the short answers. I think I will just give you those. Something about looking at text is it's just not right. It's not the, PowerPoint is bad enough, right? I mean, but looking at something that's not even a picture, that's not good. So, uh, the short answers to these three questions, let's give you, if you will, the Texas school presentation, which is tell them what you're gonna tell them, tell them, tell them what you told them. Uh, I think where Obama strived to eliminate nuclear weapons and institutionalize nuclear security and non-proliferation uh, uh, agreements, um, the 2018 National Security Strategy document that the Trump administration has put out, the National Defense Strategy that Secretary of Defense Matt has put out, and the Nuclear Posture Review, which also came from the Defense Department, emphasize two things that have a slight, slightly different emphasis, you know, different syllable. First, they say repeatedly that the U.S. must compete militarily against China, Russia, Iran, and the DPRK. That's the North Koreans. By, among other things, modernizing uh, our nuclear arsenal and missile defenses and making our nuclear use policies, nuclear weapons use policies, uh, more credible. Second, that for now, nuclear weapons elimination should be viewed as being impractical. They, they don't say it isn't desirable. I mean, they don't go that far. But 
they say, for the moment, it's very hard to think about arms control, nuclear arms control, much less nuclear weapons elimination. Now, with regard to the key military nuclear threats that the administration has emphasized, and which ones I think are most amenable to arms control, um, I think there are two that stand out. Uh, and these are military. I think they do talk about uh, the spread of nuclear weapons. I think that's most amenable to control efforts that focus on the dual use dimension of nuclear power and nuclear facilities and nuclear materials. So again, that's for Professor Bannister's class. The two we will focus on today is the spread of nuclear capable missiles. Uh, these are missiles large enough to lift you know, fairly large uh, payload, a fairly decent distance. Um, and Chinese and Russian programs designed to deny the US military and commercial use of space. It has to do with knocking satellites out of the sky, basically. We'll get to that in a moment. Now, uh, as for what successful arms control effort uh, there is that gives us any guidance on how to deal with these two threats, the one I'm going to focus on is one that I personally was involved in when I served in the Senate uh, as a Senate aide to uh, Senator Dan Quayle, who later became Vice President. And he sat on the Armed Services Committee. Um, that office my, that I worked in was very much engaged in the negotiations, and we took trips to uh, the negotiators in Vienna. Uh, in any case, what I'm talking about is the 1987 Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, which, of course, is in the news today because 30 years later it's been violated. It's not clear what its future will be. At the time, though, it leveraged US deployments of missiles in Europe to get Russia to join us in eliminating an entire class of weapons. And we'll come back to that. I think it's uh, pretty important as a president and helps suggest how, if you're building up, you may want to do a arms control effort along a similar line.